Good evening. Uh, my name is Maureen Salmon. I'm the curator of um, Energy 2022. A very warm um, welcome to the London College of Communication. It's my absolute privilege to welcome you to celebrate our Windrush Day. We're going to be celebrating the stories of journeys, of dreams, ambitions, achievements, as well as resilience of the communities. Mm -hmm. and, um, in a moment, I will have um, a welcome from Professor David Embar, who is our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Knowledge Exchange and Enterprise for the University. And I do want to stress that this is a knowledge exchange uh, project. And for me, I've been exploring, um, you know, the whole idea around knowledge exchange and actually what it is, it's about storytelling. So over to David. Good evening everyone and a very warm welcome from me. Um, I am Professor David Mba and I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor responsible for research, knowledge exchange and enterprise at the University of the Arts London. Um, I must say I'm just looking at the screen I can see myself on a huge screen I've never, I've never seen myself that big before. <laughs> anyway, great thank you. Well um, it's a it's a great pleasure to say a few words to introduce this Windrush Day event tonight. Following on from the success of the university's first African symposium on the 16th of, of June. With these events, we aim to highlight the importance of Africa and the African diaspora communities, both in the United Kingdom and globally. I would also like to take this opportunity to once again acknowledge the contributions of staff and students of African heritage and their role at the university in the implementation of our equality, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism strategy and action plan. The event tonight, Emi Ijo 2022, is led by Maureen Salmon, who is a senior lecturer at the London College of Communications. It has come about in collaboration with the British Nigerian storyteller, Peter Badejo, artistic director of Badejo Arts, who has created, who created the original Ami Ijo 2000, Heart of Dance, and Dr. Olu Taiwo, the scriptwriter. Together, they have created an interdisciplinary storytelling event which is an example of how new learning and knowledge creation about lost histories, cultures, practices from an African perspective can shape research. Ami Ejo, Heart of Dance 2000, is an inversion of Joseph Conrad's famous book, Heart of Darkness, and was originally an interdisciplinary live performance on a boat that sailed on the Thames, from Greenwich Pier to the London South Bank Pier. In 2000, the project aimed to celebrate the achievements of migration of African diaspora and their contributions to British society. This evening, we follow up that event with a fresh look at stories of journeys and achievements of the Windrush generations and migrants from post-colonial Africa. The organizers hope this will inspire the imagination and creativity of future generations of artists, activists, scholars from all racial and cultural backgrounds for the next 75 years. This project is a great example of the work that we want to do as a university, particularly on our social purpose agenda. I'm very pleased that the organizers have benefited from the support and expertise of many colleagues at London College of Communication, notably the MA Documentary Film, but also from Decolonizing Arts Institute and the Photography and Archive Research Center. For it is only by colleagues working closely together that the university will achieve its aim of promoting social and racial justice. Unfortunately, I cannot be there in, in person, but I wish you all an exciting and inspiring evening. Thank you so much.
Um, we'll now um, like to welcome Tony Snow, who is the co-chair of the EDI um, Staff Development Fund and is also um, a lecturer here at London College of Communication. Just a few words really of, of, of gratitude really. Um, just to say, a couple of weeks ago, we all got to celebrate what, two special days of cultural celebration, thanks to the, the Queen spending 70 years on the throne. But four years ago, society at large got to celebrate 70 years of cultural celebration, no, 70 years since Windrush arrived. Um, and we've got that day to mark, and thanks to people like Maury, we're able to kind of celebrate this and keep it conscious in people's minds for all the right reasons. There's so much, I'm a journalist by trade, there's so much bad press out there about how society kind of is treating our Windows generation. But what we get here is an opportunity to celebrate all the positives that the enrichment of British society, that the Windrush generation is a symbol of, Really, we can, we can go all the way. I'm a co-chair of the EDI steering group at LCC. Our job is to kind of work with people within the, within the organization, within the college, and help support them, bring their visions of quality, diversity, diversity and inclusion to life. Um, we have a fund, we have a pot of money. Um, we've actually got money that we're still trying to spend. So if anyone here, has got any ideas and wants to spend the money, let's spend it so they don't take it away from us, okay? So we're always looking for innovative projects which might bolt on to academic learning, but right across the, the families of the, of the college. So any, anyone who's got anything they want to take forward, particularly with Black History Month in, in mind, um, we've got some money available for that. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. And, and thank you, Maureen, for getting such a, a great project together. Cheers. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, we will now show the a seven minute film of Emijo 2000. And I should say that the film is made by um, Paula Watson and uh, George uh, Ponser, who um, George is not able to be here, but Paula is on her way. Badajo Arts has always been in the situation where we extend or widen the barriers in, 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 in the concept on people's minds of what African dance is. Emijo means the heart of dance and is an oblique view of the um, Conrad's book, The Heart of Darkness, which um, apparently a journey in the heart of darkness started at Greenwich. And this production too is starting at Greenwich, but instead of going towards Africa, it's coming back in towards Britain, into London. So Emijo, meaning the heart of dance, is out of the so-called heart of darkness comes the heart of dance, which is the heart of life. So simply it means the heart of dance. second part of a two-part series of Badi Arts looking at the immigration of black people into this country from the diaspora and from the continent. 
Peter came up with an idea first of, of wanting to talk about the migrations of the peoples from the Caribbean and also from West Africa and how they came to this country um, and what their lives were, what happened to them. But primarily, what were their aspirations, thoughts, feelings, what kinds of work they were doing beforehand, and to somehow symbolize that in movement and storytelling. <laughs> From the source is the heart of dance. Within the heart of dance is the rhythm of life. From the rhythm of life, all things were born. Now the horizon promises to stretch far, far away, way beyond our reach. As the ship takes us into the territory of Oloko, the river goddess, Owner of the sea. We travel from Greenwich on the water, which is the first part of the performance, because it's all divided into three sections. The first is the storytelling on the boat about the journey of the people, their aspirations, their expectations coming into Britain. getting their ideas and their feedback, all this helps to actually create and to shape the actual end product. Kumila is a dance from Jamaica. Um, it's a spiritual dance. What I like about Kumila, particularly in this production, is just simply the relationship between the drummer and the dancer. The dancer is totally dictated to by, by the drummer. It's not that he's just not incidental. He tells her what to do, when to stop, etc, etc. And that interplay is, is very nice. It's fun. Today we live in politically correct times and, you know, it seems we can be confused into believing that it's always been okay. It hasn't. And my parents and their generation suffered an awful, awful lot. And um, just the fact that just one generation later, I'm doing so much better than my parents did. Um, we must not forget, you know, their trials and triumphs. Remember that memory is the gift of our becoming. Should disaster strike and we lost our memory, we lose our memory. Uh, and we find ourselves in a very cold embrace. Remember to remember the masquerade. The masquerade is the connection between us and our ancestors. The second part is the terrace, which is they are coming to this country, the meeting of people here. We must remember Britain had been a multicultural society even before black people came here. And this is not the first, Windrush is not the first time black people came into this country. There had been black people even in the days of the Roman Empire. So um, the, the meeting, the terrorist performance, which is represented by the Irish, the Asian, and Afro-Caribbean uh, performance, is just the significance of the people that have been here even before we came. Yeah.
of having the first performance on the water and then coming into land and then coming into this bare concrete reality at the top roo rooftop of the, of, of the Queen Elizabeth Hall is an experience. It's now the experience of what the people have been through since they've been here, which is the, uh, the rooftop performance, which is the last part of the performance. We arrive here in England and the movements we do kind of reflect the coldness and the hostility as well that black people found when they came. The buzzwords kind of cultural diversity, multiculturalism and all this stuff and everyone talks about it as if um, we should be kind of grateful for that whereas in fact no it's something we've worked towards and we've you know, we've gone to a great deal of trouble to achieve what we've got today. People take it for granted that we, we arrived and we had this kind of easy time, but that isn't the case. And I think this piece of work wants to show that this is the pathway, this is what we went through to get to where we are now. need to kind of take censorship of what they have done, what they have, how they got here. We cannot forget how we came here uh, as much as we are progressing. We are in the new millennium, but we have to take into account our existence here. This is the third generation, I think, of blacks in this country from the 50s. And um, they have achieved things. We have people who have achieved in all, uh, in all aspects of, um, of existence. So that's, a, that's what we, we look at in the, at the rooftop and the celebrations of this achievement.
England, here we come. So we'll have the opportunity to ask questions, but now I'm going to introduce um, a panel. Um, Peter Badejo uh, is one of the UK and Nigeria foremost choreographer and former. And um, I was chair of Badejo Arts for 10 years from 1990 to 2000, so that's the connection. And this was our big millennium project. Um, Dr. Olu Taiwo, who's the script writer for Emma And I first worked with uh, Olu in 1998 on a digital uh, project called Talents and Skills 2000. And we had an amazing experimental work in the what is now the Design Museum. It used to be the Commonwealth um, Institute Gallery. And we had uh, young people from across London working with Olu, we were exploring digital technology and carnival at the time. Um, Catherine, who is um, on Zoom from Trinidad as the designer. Are you there, Catherine? And the photographer, uh, Eve Salmon. And Eve is a corporate and editorial um, portraiture uh, photographer, and she combines her artistic work alongside commercial and she is also an associate um, lecturer here at LCC and she is my sister <laughs> and very so proud of her <laughs> and um, her, she started we got we both got Kodak Instamatic 33 as a Christmas present we had one each and here we have Eve as the photographer and I'm delighted that she's now in um, academia. I also acknowledge earlier the filmmaker, um, Paula Watson, who I think you stand up. And Paula wasn't able to participate. It's all documentation, documenting our history through photographs and through the film. If we did not have this film, we would have had these photographs to rely on, but I am so happy that we made it possible to pay for the film and it's very beautiful. Um, so thank you. Um, you're welcome to join <laughs> the panel, but I'm not going to put you um, in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We worked together on TS2K and Paula was a centre manager for the Creative Enterprise Centre in Brixton. And she was one of the, among the first who got a Nesta Fellowship for an amazing award. And that was towards professional development of her film career. And the image was one of the outcomes. So thank you. It was significant, and we've also got onto our uh, Rasinga, this musician. Um, he wasn't involved with oh. MJ. I worked with Rasinga in late in when he was a student at Brighton um, University. Yes. And we, sorry, yes, yes, <laughs> and he's an amazing. Um, you know, musician, educator, and music therapist. Yes. And he's going to be um, taking us, serenading us uh, throughout the um, evening. Emma Jo is significant in that I included it in an exhibition I did three years ago. 
and called uh, Made in Jamaica, which was about telling my own story for the first time. I came here and I was teaching and I did not share my story in my journey. And so uh, Royal gave me the opportunity to do that. And um, I did. And Emma Jo was one of the examples that I used to illustrate my work. And um, the creative team had some had not met for 22 years. And we had the first meeting on Zoom in January. Mm -hmm. And it was, I'm really so glad we recorded it because it was absolutely, uh, I will let him talk about that experience. And so through a series of conversations, we are here today. And I do want to, um, to thank them. So I'm going to start, now you've seen the film, I'm going to start with Peter. And um, I'd say as the chair, you know, my job was to find the resources, make that production happen to budget. And um, it wasn't easy. We had three years of planning it. And um, I'm so glad we did, Peter. And actually, since I've been, I have forgotten what it's like working with artists until <laughs> <So laughs> I started interfacing. <laughs> Um, with them. So I'm going to start by asking um, Peter, what's the significance of Amateur 2000 to you? And also what we're trying to do now with Amateur 2022. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you, Mark, for this project recognition. But first, I must say, MEJO is a project that has many parents. <laughs> we have a writer, we have a cinematographer, we have a costumer, we have lots of people who collaborate. Uh, as a young woman from Nigeria, I come from a storytelling culture. And um, the Yorubas have tested philosophies as proverbs. For example, you say the world is a marketplace. And um, being a marketplace, home is when we go above, when we leave this world. But while we're on earth, we are all storytellers within the market. So uh, I experienced the mainland for about 10, 12 years before a major came about. It's metaphorically, it's like pregnancy within the African culture, within black culture, when you are pregnant, it takes more than you yourself to have a baby. Then it takes more than you and whoever was around to take care of the baby, to grow it up, to take care of it and become part of the community. And that's what Emilio is. Thank God, Maureen is a godparent to the project. So when we did the 2000 project, it wasn't enough. It still haunted her, and she's making sure that is relevant to our thinking in the next 75 years, which is very interesting. And um, the project on its own is about the present, the past, the present, and the future of people who are involved, the kind of people, and the black people generally. If you look at the first part of it, the storytelling is the story of how we all came whether from the continent or from the diaspora. And um, you can see what they brought with themselves. They are happy people. They, are, they have intention. They have expectations. They have assumptions. And what they met in the host country is quite different from, I'm sure, from what they expected. But that notwithstanding, whatever they met, whatever they got, they were able to use it and got to where they are. And at the end, they were able to stand on their own and look towards the future. And now the future we're talking about is where does the concept of a major grow in terms of our storytelling, in terms of our, all of us telling stories. I'm not just artists, I'm lecturers, I'm dancers, administrators, and things. We're all storytellers. What stories are we going to tell in the next 75 years? 
and how are they going to tell the stories? In what form? It is very interesting. But what we do now is what determines the story we tell in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll, uh, I'll do. Um, given your role as the scriptwriter, um, what, how did NGO impact on you personally and professionally? Because when we had the Zoom conversation back in January, we talked about it, but it marked the start of the journey that took you to Africa. Would you like to share that with us? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I also like to just. Um, uh, we'll say proper thanks to Nori Articles, but I will touch base on them now. I think it's excellent that we come together in this particular context. Um, yeah, so my name is um, Olubenga Olushala Elijah Tyler. Uh, my mother is from uh, Ijebu, Yoruba, and my father is kind of what he's Ijebu as well. Um, I was born in Clapham, South London. Uh, as a result of, you know, I'm, I'm part of the result of the empire. The, 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 the independence in, in, in uh, 1916. So there was a post colonial period where Nigeria was finding its feet as a kind of nation which had an implosion built into it. That's, that's for another day. So when the, um, all of Growing up in this country, there was always a schism. And that schism, <clears throat> when I say schism, it's a kind of, uh, I always realized that my worldview, my Yoruba worldview, as a Yoruba person born in this country, is very different from my grammar school education. And I didn't know how to resolve that. I didn't have the language. And also, I grew up cheer you know when you're young you don't really understand things and you see Tarzan and cheer and Tarzan. I was cheering for Tarzan. I didn't realize that that was part of the white supremacist sort of uh, you know handbook. But you you're innocent you just you're given a hero and you think that's it. So there was a real there were real things I needed to unpack. And anyway, we started working with Emma and uh, Peter asked me so to say I was a script writer I would think of it in terms of collaborator. People would come with ideas, we took the theatre. I brought in some philosophies that I've been studying. I started to research into ancient Kemet and I looked at different philosophies and also my Yoruba uh, upbringing. <clears throat> I had to unpick the whole Christian thing because I think a lot of Yorubas find that difficult with their own tradition because they were taught that it was witchcraft and not actually culture. So I, was, I had to sort of go through that. Um, but what we did, and what, what was interesting about the process is that uh, Peter said something was really important that uh, Conrad had assumptions going into Africa. But he didn't know that Africa has got full of rich history and stories and ideas. And I wanted to find out about those. And I wanted to tell those stories because they're untold in, 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 in uh, Western society. I wasn't told at school. I was told something else uh, with that was a kind of underpinning that Africa was starving and it's bad governments. So, um, so that process led me on to uh, looking at uh, the way in which we perceive rhythm, I'll do an exercise later on, uh, the way we perceive time and space and the paradigm of time and space. So my, my PhD revolves around that. And I went through a lot of books uh, to try and find the way out. But in the end, I found the story through rhythm, through the golden triangle. And so I did my PhD in, in the uh, performance philosophy, which was to do with the return beat. Uh, and last year, despite all the trials and tribulations I had in the, the illness, I published my, my, my first book, my um, uh, PhD monograph. Uh, it's published out now called The Return Beat, Interfacing with Our Interface. And it's looking at those paradigms of thinking from a kind of personal point of view with, with the community as a kind of business. Uh, so that in a nutshell is, is, is 
where I've come from. It's, it's, it's a long journey. So it's really, I mean, when Maureen contacted me, I was like, oh my goodness, this is like, this is what I've got. It's like, this is, this is, this has been my life's work. And actually, it's, it's, it's a gift. And I was able to give you the book, which is a really clear system. Peter's in the book, you know, and he's, he's one of the people that helped me think through these ideas. So. Thank you, Alex. How long did it take to do the PhD? Seven years. Yeah, so it's, so it's seven years part time. So there's so many stories. I won't go into the whole story now, but, but it was seven years. Um, and uh, I was also doing a full time job at the same time. So, so I had to do some juggling. <laughs> So, um, over to Catherine. Reflecting on your many years collaboration with um, the Dejo Arts, what was significant about Emijo to you personally and professionally? Well, what I would say is, off the bat, one of the reasons that I worked with Badejo Arts for that for a decade was because most of the productions that we did reflected something about the human condition and the enduring spirit of a people. So in terms of my own relationship to that, I was a migrant living in London for about 10 years at the time. So the subtle and present feelings in my life as a migrant were all being sort of played out through the work on this production. And it, so it was pertinent to my own life. And I loved how it conveyed aspects of the migrant communities from both sides of the Atlantic. You know, um, in London, it's a, a melting pot of people. So a lot of people join forces um, to bring this particular production together from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, to me, it conveyed something about the strength and resilience of a people. What I could do is go through my thought process very quickly in four different aspects. The graphic design that I, I would do for Badejo Arts to start with, to gel the ideas and the concepts the set and costume design, the props that were important to me as um, artifacts of migrants, uh, travel and journeys, and then the costume design, which had an element that showed something of the present time. So I'm going to share my screen. So these are documents I've scanned from my archive. Um, when I first started working on this, the two things that were very uh, important was one, water and crossing of water, and then of course, reaching land. So everything in the graphic design had something to do with the journey, a long line, a boat across water. So the, the, all the paraphernalia, all the, the program, everything was designed in that way. When it came to the set design, I was looking at the reflection, the, the, what the mirage, the, the image that people could see of themselves in the water or in the community against the kind of environments that they came from, which were more earthbound to the environments that they ended up with, which were more concrete and urban. So it was about the crossing of the water and so we kind of played this out on the rooftop of the Royal Festival Hall, which was perfect environment for it. So I created a square where in, the immigrants could inhabit that, that space as, as they would have an apartment or a building. And I created a sort of journey that they could travel along a mirrored walkway, which was like the river, the pathway. And I used a lot of elements of migrant travel that was a universal thing which is the sacking bags bags made out of sacking and i also used 
the high visibility jackets because in london just traveling around london going to do your daily chores there was always the presence of migrants on the streets in the subways and so on so in terms of the props i kind of just collected a number of articles that reflected our what would be dear to people what what people would need as tools i mean sort of in an anthropological way and these were scattered across the the stage but then they were moved to the side with with the choreography so the whole idea was that the clothes lines which is a universal thing would then also reflect as a drawing on the floor through the shadows so in, they would reflect in the mirrored um, walkway and they would reflect in shadows on the ground and the, the performers would dance through these drawings so they were not only intangible things hanging on a line but they were also in your psyche and in the subtle thing of the floor where the migrants so they might the dancers are interacting with those shadows as they're performing and the audience is seeing that visual and it's in the background it doesn't have to be something that's one of the one of the most important things for me was that all things came together not only the story but also the set the props the costumes the music all come together as one and that makes a really good production and in these this the part the last slide and this slide we used broomsticks and sticks which are universal tools as well and in the costumes the two most important things was what well, the three most important things was in the river journey and the people coming to this urban environment they would be in their traditional wear and they were brightly colored but as they came into this terraced environment we would pull out and and hone in on the sort of symbolic colors of the life of a migrant in the city so uh, underneath they wore high visibility colored clothes to can, to relate to the high visibility jackets of migrant workers but and but over the top they wore these transparent lycra um trousers and tops that really echoed like the skin because as a migrant you felt vulnerable you felt um you know that you were you were being basically playing out your life in the public in these pu very public jobs and so that was the kind of message i was trying to convey with the costuming So I hope it came together to have that kind of power. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um... Uh, so, how can you, your recollection of the day, um, because we seem, it's been condensed into, I think seven hours condensed into um, 12, 13 minutes, we're going to ask Paula how they managed that uh, in a moment, but you were there throughout the day and you captured lots of images, and um, when we talked on Zoom, um, uh, you shared how it's impacting you, just not something we never really talked about. Mm. So I was really quite um, taken back at the impact that it had um, on your work as a photographer and also uh, personally. Can you share that with us? Um, so Roy did say, Hello, uh, by the way, I'm Sammy, like I said, I'm a photographer. And um, Roy said to choose two to three images. Um, but to be honest, everyone knows that photographers generally are not very good at editing their own work. So I've got um, uh, a little slideshow, uh, which will just run um, in the background. And um, I will say that I think we didn't really talk about it much, or maybe at, at the beginning, but it's like 20 years ago. Um, and I think often photographers, they've done a job and they kind of move on. Um, 
sort of led me to the next thing. Um, having said that, um, it said that um, if you love um, what you're paid to do, then it never feels like work. Uh, and in over 20 years of making images, um, this is one of my favorite and most memorable pieces of work. Um, in my 20s, I spent a lot of my weekends at Greenwich Market, uh, and uh, I still frequent the South Bank a lot, socially and for work. Uh, so the day actually does come to mind um, quite often. Um, my brain slightly struggles with events like this because there is the necessity to do the job and document what I see, but um, also there's great compulsion to participate, such is the power of the performance and the music. Um, and I find myself trying to encapsulate my own feelings uh, of the moment into the making um, of the images. Um, in retrospect, I wish there'd been uh, a dress rehearsal for me uh, of the whole process. Um, but part of the richness of the day was uh, the spontaneity. Um, and technically, um, I, over the years, I have learned to anticipate moments and sometimes literally keep the other eye open. Uh, while I'm shooting. Um, in the video, uh, Peter spoke about storytelling, uh, about people's dreams, aspirations and experiences, um, and all these elements are more feed into my own documentary practice today, um, which involves collecting um, and sharing those stories and experiences of migration. Um, I think one of the reasons that this work has resonated with me so strongly um, is that I am a Londoner, uh, born and bred, uh, and I'm actually currently preoccupied with a project about my father's working life as a carpenter, as a skilled tradesman, uh, most of which was spent in the city of London. And when I say city, I mean the financial district, Square Mile, um, which obviously needed substantial rebuilding after the blitz of World War II. Um, he and my mother are Jamaicans uh, of the Windrush generation. When I look back at the images of MJ, I feel emotional. Um, and it's been like that. It was like that yesterday in my meetings and uh, when Maureen asked me to kind of source the pictures. Um, it was the most beautiful sunshine day, which you can see. Um, and to me, that spoke of the weather that many of the diaspora have left behind. Um, I think about the group's emergence from the Festival Pier Tunnel uh, and what that signifies. Um, uh, my interpretation of the fabrics, it's interesting hearing Catherine talk, I mean, when I think about the shimmer of the fabric, and that was kind of enhanced by the artificial and natural light, and how to me that represented the diaspora's yearnings, um, hopefulness, and their ambitions. Um, there was, yeah, it was just a, a just the way that the light kind of sparkled on that translucent fabric. And um, what I would say to students um, is that as a documentarian, particularly when doing long form work, I think one's approach has to be off the heart because that is what keeps you motivated uh, when the going gets tough. Um, I'll paraphrase an American uh, photographer, Aaron Turner, um, and he says, you know, coming from a particular community, does not automatically give you a free pass within that community. Um, you still have to gain people's trust. Um, you don't just get to raise the camera. So I try and think about that when uh, I'm asking people to share their life, their life stories. Um, authenticity flows from being invested and people will share their stories if they sense that you are sincere. Um, and then just back to Emmy Jo, um, I just feel proud uh, really to have participated in the documenting of this work. So, Paula, so you had the task <laughs> <laughs> um, of doing a lot of shooting <laughs> and um and then produce what we are now able to share today um now watching this again i don't know when the last time you know we watched it how do you feel what's your emotion well thank you maureen for organizing today and for 
make it possible for me to be here. It's really amazing and wonderful to see everyone again. I hadn't watched the film for 20 years and uh, saw it again, not tonight, but you know, when you first approached me. I was really shocked actually, because it'd be like you to just said, <clears throat> when you're, if you do creative projects, I mean, you do so many of them, especially after 20 years, you move on in your mind and in your, in your work, you move on. And I was surprised at how, how sort of rich and big everything was. I'd forgotten how many dancers there were. I'd forgotten the, 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 I'd forgotten the scale of production. I was really surprised at um, how many people were there because I'd just come out of lockdown pretty much <laughs> when I watched this. I thought, wow, I mean, I've, I've forgotten the days when we do events and like 500 people would turn up for them. <laughs> so I was sort of, if it's not boastful, to, to say on all of our behalves, proud and impressed, really, when I when I saw it. That's my honest opinion, if I can say that. And maybe more so than I was at the time, you know, getting a bit older and wiser. I took it for all a bit more for granted then than I was, I'd say. <laughs> but yeah, when I was that age, I was quite young then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you have a question about the filmmaking? I that yes, how did you get from those hours of footage down to? Well, actually, I was just the producer, like the organiser, and it was George Antonsa, he was the director and the editor. And I mean, he's, he can't be here today, so he, he was invited by now. And George and I have worked on many projects together by this point. And so I, the, he was very skilled, as you know, he's really skilled at um, his art form. He's a trained artist. He knows the story of Conrad. He knew the story. He knew what you were trying to do, Peter. He's come from a Ghanaian background himself, a Londoner himself. So he had all of these sort of he really fully understood the brief. And then that coupled with amazing technical craft skills as a documentarian meant that he, you know, he he had on his storyline, he had, you know, the practical elements of the dance, the music, as you can hear, it's pretty much the same music as the beat throughout. So I think, you know, it's just the skill, his editing skill, that to have picked the you know, he would have probably made choices along the lines of, um, well, like any creative process, it's partly instinctive, part, partly technical. But I think the main thing is that he was invested in the brief and understood the brief. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, I was saying that you were not involved. <laughs> But um, having been brought into the frame for 2022, in terms of your own experience as a South African coming to the UK in 1990, um, about, and um, what, what do you make of energy and what you were trying to do? Um, I'll just say some less good. Well, I don't know, I, I, I left to start somewhere. So when I came, it was around 1989, 90s, and I ended up in Brighton, which looked like Cape Town. It was run down, it was not posh then. So I decided, oh, I think here yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been to Edinburgh and Venice and the buildings were like so, European, but Brighton was different there. So I decided to stay there. My friend left back to South Africa. I said, I'm not, I'm not going back to apartheid. And then I met up some students. And the interesting thing was that I was there. I came from South Africa. We were very isolated because in South Africa, the whole apartheid history was not about black and white. It was about isolation. Don't meet anyone from outside. Don't meet 
white people don't meet black people. Um, you just need to live in your little place and be, you know, deal with your with your surroundings. And if you do that, you'll live forever and you won't be in trouble. But when I came and stayed out, stayed in Brighton, met some other people for the first time, I met black people, um, like Maureen, <laughs> from outside South Africa, um, which was a, a, an experience for me. And then with these people coming to the story of Imajo, they also came from the Caribbean and they have left the Caribbean with an old African culture, which I've never experienced. And also there were people like Peter Morin from West Africa. I've never come across a West African person. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a person from the Caribbean. Not the dance or the music, but coming back. So when I was in Brighton, I decided to get educated because you know, I've never been to school. So I heard about Southeast art and Maureen was working for this organization. So oh, they said you could get some money to go touring, perform, and to practice with less pressure. So Maureen became our mentor, you know, they call it. she basically supported us through the process. And I was able to meet people from the Caribbean, I, everything for me was Jamaica. So if you came from the Caribbean, I never knew the difference between a Trinidadian, a Jamaican, or someone. So, so by meeting these people in this little island, England, I then knew that people from the Caribbean were also very different. And there was dances like Mento, this and that and the other. And I learned from these people and they learned from me. So we formed a group which was guided uh, by Maureen, which exposed me to other countries. And then as we kind of developed, she then introduced me to, she came and said, I'm gonna bring someone to come and teach you dance from Nigeria. I've never been in a position where I saw a Nigerian dancer or dance with a Nigerian. And Mr. Bodejo came in <laughs> into this space and then showed us this movements. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, we have to learn this. We have to understand this. So what we did in the group, there will be four of us learning or 10 of us. And then when he left, we had to take on what he has taught us and then evolve it from there. So this project for me is, um, you know, like a tree has seeds and seeds they drop and other trees come up. So from this project, although I was not there, but the seeds were blown, mm -hmm. you understand? Mm -hmm. I grew up from that and from then on, <clears throat> and now if someone says, oh, this dance from the Caribbean or this uh, from that area, I do understand it. And I'm saying thank you, Maureen, for introducing me to everybody else. And thank you everyone who's here, but also I must be honest and say thanks to England because I've been to a lot of countries and they're so racist, you can't believe this. <laughs> and uh, coming from South Africa, I understand the politics. And now I'm a music therapist and I do teach and I work with all children, even English children from little villages because I have this project and these people have taught me to adapt and that allows me to be myself. So thank you. Uh, thank you for saying this. So you can hear the, the turn beats, which we're going to come back to. Now um, it's time for you, the audience, to ask questions of the panel. Oh, don't go Questions, comments, 
So, it's all about the story. I think George did a good job because he understood the story. I'm glad you brought that up because I, that's something that I was really resonating with when both uh, Peter and Polly mentioned story. I am a therapist now as well. And in the Western iteration of therapy, it's very individualized. It's all about us as individuals. And I'm actually going through a process of starting to investigate healing, the healing power of storytelling. And I think that story is something that we bring with us, Africa, Jamaica, and it's about us together. And it's about, well, in this day and age, it's so important that we tell our stories, isn't it? And that we, we pass on to the other generation no, I feel I feel part of a lineage here. That's what I'm trying to say. Excuse me. I'm kind of I feel part of a lineage. I feel that you, Maureen, you handed something down to us. You included us in something important, and it and we must pass it on as well, because otherwise our mental health is at risk if we are these atomized individuals without our story, our told our way. I will just add to that. Thank you. Is, is that, um, and we may, we'll look at this after the break, I imagine. But um, it's not only, it is our stories. But the questions that we often have in ourselves as Africans in a diaspora and Africans on the continent is whose story are we telling? What frame are we telling it through? What context are we experiencing the story? The assumption is <clears throat> stories are experienced through a Western frame. Books, writing. I say that with irony because I've just published the book yet. Shameless plug, I know, but you know. Um, but the question is, what story are we telling? How are we telling it? And um, you would know Ubuntu, um, made famous by Nelson Mandela uh, and um, De Desmond Tutu. In in um, in Britain, we have this term, you know, with Descartes, who say, "I think, therefore I am." And so they have this idea of uh, elegant doubt about things, like questioning. As I said before, they can't got a bad rap because the church got onto them and said, that, okay, if you've got a split between mind and body, we're looking after the mind, you stay in the body. So he, in a sense, he couldn't really write what he wanted to say. Mm -hmm. However, that split is individualistic. It starts with the individual. I think that's where I am. The equivalent from an African point of view, and this is why I think Desmond Tutu, particularly Desmond Tutu, is an absolute genius um, of mind. You, you would say, I am because we are. Since we are, therefore I am. Now, that is a beautiful, elegant way of saying, I am an individual because of the community. There's no separation. And because of the community, I can exist as an individual. It's impossible to be a human being isolated on some island somewhere. How would you learn to speak? Who would you speak to? How could you discern things? You'd, you'd be in a very different, I mean, that kind of Robinson Crusoe idea of, is, is very much a kind of, you know, uh, Renaissance fantasy. Can't happen. Um, so that notion of how we tell our stories, that context changes everything about how we, how we want to frame mental health because i think in us in our dna right back from when we come from africa is this sense of we know we are together but it's not some kind of um marxist concept where we're all the same no no you know we know in, in, in especially in nigeria if you come with the same shoes oh you take your shoes off man they're my shoes it's a sense that people want to be different but we want to be different to show 
and how the spirit oh, I like what we got on that nice. and it's a sense of play and so this is a, I think this is really important it's totally sorry yes I, I it's, uh, I've been in this country for about 26 years now and just as I think I'm beginning to understand a bit of it the goalpost changes I know I'm not that brilliant and I realized that the system finds a way of weakening our collective strength. Mm -hmm. Be it the theater, be it the medicine, be it whatever. Mm -hmm. And it promotes the individualism to a point where it completely neutralizes the collective effort. Mm -hmm. Not until we are able to tell our stories, ourselves, as a collective effort of existence. Mm -hmm. There isn't much we are offering the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Douglas. We have a story to tell next time round. Mm -hmm. um, and Douglas and I and Paula work together at TS2K um, in the Commonwealth Gallery space. Um, any more questions, comments? Uh, hi, my name is uh, I'm a graduate student. Uh, I'm from Turkey, I'm British, so I'm learning from you. Thank you for everything you taught us today. Um, the previous session was great. <laughs> I won't forget it. Thank you for that as well. Uh, I just, I'm really curious, and please forgive me. This is a very direct question. A very personal question. Uh, when you study the decolonizing period, and when you see stories, when you heard stories from the parents of uh, the previous generations, do you feel angry? Okay. This is a complex question. <laughs> it's a complex answer. For me, personally, yes and no. Please make an answer. Yeah, yes, because there is, particularly with some of the secret knowledges of our people. Um, so I was saying to one person about you know, filmmakers, a bit not document documentary makers, not the same, they're not the haters as much as anthropologists when they go to Africa. I would say if you come to my house, if I go to your house, you're gonna tidy up. And you anything that's secret that you've got to, you'll put it in a cupboard somewhere and keep quiet. And you're gonna, and I'll be your guest. You'll only show me what you want me to see. Mm -hmm. And somehow, anthropologists think they're gonna to go to a, a, a culture and they won't see them coming. And then they're not gonna sort of do the same. And then they report, oh, they, these people believe in this and believe in that, and they do this. And they, as if to say, well, and so on one level, there's a sense of protection in them because they do that within their own uh, people. Because, you have to kind of earn the right to get close to the sort of knowledge that we're talking about. Um, you have to earn the right, there's a kind of internal process, an internal rite of passage. Um, but the problem, uh, where my anger comes is that, is that where the West has come in to a different paradigm and Christianity and Islam have come in, there's a sense that it's been shoved down and there's some people that may die with the knowledge. I'm angry that it shouldn't happen. We should find ways to get that knowledge out and make it safe to give to our young, to our younger generation, mm -hmm. so that they can see the glory in the, the, the spectrum. So that's one thing. So I, 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 I but where I'm not is because I understand the trauma of colonization of slavery, um, and also the systematic. You know, there's a, there's a particular joke that I say to my students. It's come from somebody who's from uh, from uh, uh, Botswana. I think Botswana. He said, um, "I just translated words." So I, I have a, about thirty students, white students, human, and one person's black. And I said to him, "You don't mind me teaching you six foot five, or a black man? You don't mind me teaching you? You're fine with that." <laughs> You know, I'm setting up here, giving you knowledge about my culture, about history, and you're totally fine with that. 
200 years ago, this would be an auction. It's meant to be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is, is your, your reaction is exactly how they react, which is like, oh my God. You know, like, you, you, I can't laugh at that. Of course, when I say it's meant to be a joke, they burst out of laughing because obviously they, but we've got to get to that stage where we say, we can't, I can't pretend that didn't happen. It is part of the story. Mm. Elephant and Castle here, code name, slave trade. Mm -hmm. Elephant Castle, oh, the Elephant Castle. How many people actually know that? Now, it's not to belittle it, it's just to know the facts. Mm -hmm. It's to tell the story. Mm -hmm. So, whose story are we telling? And again, that's actually with, with a workshop that Peter <laughs> made so beautifully last uh, earlier about bias and expectation and presumption. So, yeah. So, so you triggered me there, so I don't you know what I mean. I'm yeah. triggered myself, but thank you for the question. Thank you for that. Thank you. And Maureen, there's, there's some questions from those who are um, on Zoom. Um, in fact, Catherine had a comment too. Catherine, I wonder if Catherine wants to come in to make that comment. I mean, I could, rather than read it out there, Catherine, if you're, if you're still with us. Oh, sure. I was, I was responding to Eve's um, comment about the shimmering fabric. And... Um, I had remember she made me remember that when I had started the design process, one of my notations was that I, I would have to dust the props or the set or something with gold or metallics. And in a way, we got a little element of that in with the the walkway, but we also got it in as Eve's realized with the fabric. But, but that little shimmering something was to represent hope, you know, that if you did migrate to this new world, there would be hope. So that's kind of what was going on in my mind. And there's also a message from, um, from Mercy in the chat, um, talking about the closing line from Peter about what we do now will determine the storytelling of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, she found that very powerful. And her question is, with the changing landscape of the diasporas, how do we ensure that the environments we now face retain the important elements that are necessary uh, to be kept for posterity? So I suppose she's, she's getting there about, you know, what are those, what are the important elements that we need to be keeping going forward in this next 75 years, I suppose? That's, that's for Warren to answer. However, <laughs> no, 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 however, I'll come in the sense that it, it, when two, 22 years ago, when the ideas of Enrico and some productions that some of us were doing happened, there was a problem. In the, it was, was like the end of African Caribbean dances as exhibition. Mm -hmm. And some of us came and said, look, wait a minute, we are communicating something. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to find a way of retelling our story rather than it being just. And the exhibition thing is not African or Caribbean. Mm -hmm. It actually is an adaptation of what they think the West wants to see. Mm -hmm. So when our story then started coming with meaning, then the neutralization started coming mm -hmm. through education through institutions, mm -hmm. through looking at the artists and say, what are they producing? Mm -hmm. So to the point where even at that period, there were certain consistent meetings of families of black people. I was learning, I mean, as a, I was a student at that time. I mean, still a student of life. We were learning from one another because there is a problem between the diaspora and the continent in terms mm -hmm. of educating one another. So it was a beginning of understanding each other, <clears throat> but all of a sudden, that has dipped again. Not until we rediscover ourselves and our togetherness, our collectiveness, there's going to be a problem about what we're doing to the future. Mm -hmm. So very important. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Um, thank you for saying no out of final questions or comments, and we're going to have you. Yeah. I did. I just wanted to, um, could you talk more about the 
how, how you started to, to develop? Like, what was the starting point? Was there a script? Was it devised? How did it, you know, I'm just really keen to. I think um, are, you, are you able to answer it because Peter and Olivia can talk. Answer. Yes, um, I think we're going to take a break because I'm really mindful of time, yeah. and uh, we'll come back to it. But one point I just want to pick up on is that um, the Caribbean is now. The sixth region of the African Union. Yes. yes. A cultural partnership um, going on as we speak between you know Nigeria and Ghana, um, and so that's very exciting. That's when I talk about the next seventy-five years, um, and. Um, you know, I, we're going to talk in the next section about the population mm -hmm. for Africa for the next 50 years. We have the largest workforce uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. And when you combine that together with the Caribbean and those two coming together mm -hmm. and the action that's been taken by a number of Caribbean islands in terms of um, their future, I think the world is, you know, is looking different and will be different. So that's the next part. So we take a 10 minute break. And um, again, I've asked him to share his thoughts in the context of what he has heard today. Mm -hmm. And also because he's also curated um, a series of talks here at the university on challenging times and different kinds of pandemics. And um, I invited him to, uh, to join us um, <coughs> as we are inclusive, as you can see from the time of wind rush and how we've had to integrate with communities and people from all over the world. So, um, I just, um, um, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya. Yeah. Uh, obviously, from Asian parents, Indian parents. <coughs> On my mother's side, um, they were brought uh, to build railways in East Africa. Yeah. So that's the kind of lineage that happened. Although I was born in Nairobi, Kenya, my father was from Uganda, next to Rwanda. And we were thrown out. We had to leave, um, not with Idi Amin, but the president beforehand. So I came here 
a weekend here. And I started my life, my new life at the age of 10 in South Lambeth Road, uh, Stockwell and Brixton. So, and I've been there ever since in terms of home, I live in Brixton and I've been through that journey. And so the first school I went to, I went to a primary school, I failed my 11th class because it's ironic when you say things become circular, um, the 11 plus, because in Africa, we had the decimal system, yeah? And here, they had the imperial system. Yeah. So when you did your maths exam, you failed, okay, straight away. <laughs> it's ironic that our, our prime minister has called for the imperial system to be re reignited back, you know, because it's losing in the polls is another little uh, flag-waving session to say, you know, let's go back to 12 instead of 10, uh, and then everything will be wonderful, right? And bring back guineas. I remember being in Brixton Market first time and there was a television for sale and it was 10 guineas. I thought, what the hell is this? You know, does anyone know what a guinea is? No, it's 21 shillings, right? Do you know what shillings are? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, 20 shillings becomes one pound, right? Okay. So it was about relearning all, 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 of, all of that. And the school I went to in Abattersea, Clapham, yeah, uh, was called William Blake School. Uh, and I was the only Asian boy there. It was a boys only school because we failed the alum plus a secondary modern and the rest of the cohort were um, West Indian boys, right? We were taken on our field trip. Uh, the first field trip that we were taken to was um, Rochester Borstal, right? Okay. And we were told, we were told and just Pardon my English. This is what we were told by the governor there. Uh, if you don't know where Rochester Borstal is, it's on the A2 at the top. You know, when the hills come, when you go on the A2, that's where Rochester Borstal was. And we were taken to this room overlooking the field. There were two horses there. Uh, one was black, one was white. And the governor said, no, I'm not going to say it. Right, okay. I'm not going to say, say discuss. No, 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 no. We need to say that's chalky and the other one is a C word. Right, okay. And we were all supposed to laugh at that, right? But that was the governor of the prison. And the reason why we were taken there, we were told that this is where you can learn a trade. Okay, so it's about decorating, painting and decorating. That's what Western Indian men do. Right. Okay. So that was that was the schooling system here, um, in terms of in terms of what what was happening. That's and and I have never forgotten those words because I was brought up in Africa. Yeah. You know, I was brought up with kids, and then suddenly this this from the masters to be told in that kind of sense. So cut a long story short, we're here, and what was important is a project that I started called decolonizing the curriculum. And we produced this zine called Decolonizing the Arts Curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, we started a series of exhibitions. Um, and the first exhibition was at LCC. And I suggested that we have guest curators, people who had not been asked before to be asked. Mm -hmm. And I asked two people, well, I asked three people, but the two I'm going to be talking about very briefly. One was Carl Foster, right, who was my tutor when I, when I came to LCC. Um, and he said for 20 years, no one, he's been working here for 22 years, 23 years, no one has asked him to do anything, like a curation or anything else. So he was the first one. He was part of the Windrush generation. And he produced this poster, because what I said was, what, whatever you do, you need to document it. So can you please, with an A5 piece of paper or something like that, and Carl produced this. Carl, Carl did this poster for a very small display case. Those of you who know that in the interest of the library, it's not fantastic, but nevertheless, it's there. And then I asked Maureen, and Maureen produced another fantastic poster uh, called Made in Jamaica. Right, okay. And um, this is, do you pass it around? And this post, oh yeah, these two posters. And the Made in Jamaica poster is the one I've had so, so, so many requests of, right? Because it's a PDF. If anyone wants a copy of that, please uh, 
email me and I'll send it. But that Maureen's poster, Made in Jamaica, was a very important poster in terms of acknowledging, you know, where where things where things happened, where things have happened, where things will happen in the future. And I just want to finish off by saying, because we were talking about 25 years on, 75 years on, and I work with, at the moment, I work with a fantastic individual. I also teach at Central St. Martins on a course on BA and, and MA culture, uh, culture criticism curation course. And I work with someone called Michael McMillan. Do you know Michael, Michael McMillan? Michael McMillan did, um, his installation was, the, was at that time called the West Indian Front Room, right? Yes. Okay. And that was at the Museum of, of, of Jeffrey the Slaver, you know, at, uh, at, in Hackney. Mm. It was named after him, the Slaver. It's now called the Museum of Home. And I was working there, uh, and I had to do a survey. And it, it's a Middle England exhibition place, museum, right? Okay. And all they talk about is just rooms, the Victorian room, the Edwardian room, mm -hmm. this room, that room, and whatever. And when I had to do the survey, so where have you come from? Da, 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 da. What, what, have you, what have you come to look at? What did you find most interesting? Mm -hmm. And the number one was the Western of front room, mm -hmm. right? Okay, wasn't the Victorian, wasn't the Edwardian, wasn't the Tudor, wasn't any of that. It was the Western in front room mm -hmm. that they found the most fascinating. And this is what Michael McMillan had to say recently about the future. Um, he says, I have a lot of hope. There'll be exciting work. I think that black literature is the most exciting literature at the moment. He said that before very quickly correcting himself, this is an interview in The Guardian, it is the most exciting literature period. I think black artists are producing some of the most exciting, relevant, socially engaged work at the moment there'll be new exciting work uh, that will come. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is the future in terms of innovation, creation, etc. But, and I use this big but, I use this very, very big but. I saw at the start of the documentary, um, I think uh, Sheba Montserrat was saying, yeah. um, that we talk about multiculturalism and people are aware. And that 2000 was optimism, yeah. was very, very optimistic. Yeah. And I felt optimism in that yeah. documentary, right? Year later, 9-11 happened. Then the war happened uh, in, in Iraq. And move forward, we have the hostile environment on the streets of, of, of Lambeth and Brixton. We have the West Indian community been picked up, right, on the street, imprisoned, mm -hmm. and we had to mount a campaign to make sure that that was broken. Yeah. And I don't think we have this kind of parallel, circular, when people talk about circular, mm -hmm. inbuilt in our system, mm -hmm. right, there's a political default of racism, right? Mm -hmm. Race, and has continued part of the system, and I call it a capitalist system, and that thrives in that. It always triggers it. Yeah. And we see that, that rampant legislation has been brought in by someone with the same name as me, but no relation. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, a horrible, horrible person. And quite clearly, we will have this in parallel because the system needs to continue However, we struggle, yeah. right? And, 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 and we produce something really brilliant in terms of what's happened. And the one thing, when people talk about storytelling, is this, it is about the missions of history in individuals, yeah. in the collective, yeah. that is continually being wiped out, mm -hmm. been erased, mm -hmm. been retold in their view, yeah. right? Yeah. Rather than of the people in, in the sense that it should be, and those voices should be brought to the future. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone here has played a fantastic role in trying to do that in performance, in art, in design, in communication. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have to struggle, but it produces fantastic stuff uh, mm -hmm. as part of that. Thank you. Well, uh,
mindful of time. We've got a question from the audience, or we have not got any fresh questions here. Uh, thank you. Any questions, comments? If not, we're going to move into the return beat right. and have the rest of the event um, music. Good. I just wanted to say that the, the thing that Peter made reference to about the next 75 years, what are we leaving? Yes. And um, going on Bill's point about the mission, what we need to leave is the real truth. Mm -hmm. That is what we need to leave. But one thing is we have to re establish the line of communication. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's enough. That's For example, uh, we're talking about the story in the next two years. We don't even know some of the stories that are happening now. Mm -hmm. I was shocked when when I met Maureen and Maureen this morning, I was telling them, you all know about Patrice Lumumba, mm -hmm. who was brutally murdered, mm -hmm. first African prime minister, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and only 61 years after for Belgium to send his tooth to his family. Ah. What, what is that about? Yeah. And that's part of our next story. That's part of the story of the future. Mm -hmm. But already it's happening now. And a lot of us are not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. Not only did they brutally murdered him, mm -hmm. and there was no compensation, no apologies from the Belgian government up to today, only for them to then send a tooth is yeah. what is there? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a question. Yes. Um, how or when will the um documentary be shown on the open market if you buy? Oh, it's morning. <laughs> 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 uh, I think, well, I think now that, um, you know, we had this event and uh, when we go back to that first, uh, when I spoke to Paula, one of the immediate things that Paula said, well, you've got to get to the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And we have got an Energo YouTube channel registered. Mm -hmm. So perhaps this could be, yeah. um, you know, and it's up to it's not just me, it's up to you, you know, I think all of us yes. um to think of how we can use that and the what uh, Paula said earlier about how we incorporate this work into um you know therapy. Mm -hmm. And in the workshop I talk about how I incorporate this work into professional practices, one of the subjects that I teach, and I incorporate this into and become part of our practice mm -hmm. because we have to draw on our cultural heritage, you know, our linear, because all of that forms part of the image and brand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's whether we are, um, in, you know, not implicit about it, you know, it's there. Mm -hmm. And it took me, when I came to the university, as I said, you know, I didn't think anybody was interested or like Carl Nervously ever asked me. <laughs> and then I, when I started telling the story, the interest, I mean, I was absolutely bowled over by the interest mm -hmm. and the comments that I get and, you know, from particularly, you know, from students mm -hmm. um, that um, we do need to have more and more opportunities um, like this mm -hmm. um, and I guess we also need to just move away from just Black History Month yes. Yes. and have a year-round program and have a program like this integrated Absolutely. Um, in part of the general programming mm -hmm. um, and not be because we don't want to wait for the next Windrush day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, any more question? It's a quick question. It's not, it's just more a comment, but every, I mean, I'm just so infused by everything that you're saying. And <laughs> I just, I just feel like this storytelling piece is so key now because, you know, again, talking about post COVID, every, you know, so many institutions are being dismantled or exposed mm. to what they are. People are feeling quite adrift. And I think that sense 
of facilitating people telling their own story so that they can have a sense, like be anchored in who they are and what's come before them. I think now is a really prime time to be doing this kind of work, also because of what Paula mentioned in terms of how it helps mental health. And I just think it's, I mean, I'm a big believer in, you know, like when everything falls, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Like I don't just see disaster. <laughs> and actually this is a time for rebirth and really re-establishing what the identity of England particularly looks like. And being quite forceful in saying, this is the time now to have different stories come to the fore. Mm-hmm. But everybody's stories, like you said, not just saying it's Black History Month, mm-hmm. you know, working class London story, like there's a whole, yeah. I just think it's very, very empowering now to sort of take back the narrative from what institutions or even mainstream media have said it is, that we're all polarised and hate each other. Mm-hmm. It's quite the opposite, really, mm-hmm. you know. And so, yeah, I just feel very passionate about this. Stuff. I just wanted to ask um, why I've never asked for security. And why would you have your asked security? Well, <laughs> that's very interesting because today I was showing some literature we produced for Bandage of Arts uh, 23, 24 years ago. Um, I came into this country after I left the United States of America. And um, by passing, uh, and I thought, wait a minute, there's over 45 different African dance theater related companies. I need to contribute my own. Okay. I looked at some of their productions, I see what they were doing. Mm-hmm. I found something missing that I could contribute to. That's how I stayed. Mm-hmm. And um, at one point, I thought, no, it's not enough to teach. I taught to Tangilo, I taught to the companies, I taught to, I was popular in theater with the National Theater and all this. But I thought, no, I need to establish the kind of storytelling that I have said. That's why I started my digital arts. And to be able to help young artists who are growing up there to be able to tell their own stories, not depending on how they are asked to tell it. Mm. <clears throat> and then he went into education. Fortunately, I have people like Maureen behind me who believed in me without even knowing what I was doing yet. <laughs> you know? and, um, and there we are. Mm. But like I said, it was like it was programmed. Mm. You know, most of those companies just fell one after the other, one after the other, irrelevant of what they were doing. Mm. You know, but I, I remember there was a time when they asked one one of our companies then, which was the largest black company in Europe, said, well, uh, what you're doing that you brought you to this point, we want you to change it, do something modern, do something yes. contemporary. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and poor, poor, poor director, he went searching for contemporary African dance out of nowhere. <laughs> And in the end, they said, ah, no, no, this is not it. And they just withdrew a quarter of this of, of their funding. And that was it. See, this is what makes me mad. <laughs> no, no, seriously, because there's this thing about they hoodwink this con- they are the contemporary. Mm-hmm. Contemporary literally means of now. Mm-hmm. So if you have an active dance piece of yes. now, mm-hmm. that's not contemporary. Mm-hmm. Because no, there is an assumption that Western culture is the vanguard of human activity. And this is the problem. It's so ingrained that we have to, so when I say contemporary, what I mean is, is your style mixed yeah. with contemporary yeah. Western dance. They are called contemporary. That's what they say. That's what, and it's, 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 it's too long have we apologized yeah. and asked for permission. Yeah. And for me, my, my and, uh, uh, shameless plug, shameless plug, my book, um, which is the return beat is somehow my trying to entangle myself from this assumption um, based on the return beat. A couple of there's a couple of things that I that, that I stand on here, and, I, and, I, and I'll say this uh, in, in terms of in terms of a <clears throat> a baseline. One, uh, David Olash, should you know the guy, the the, the, the historian? Yeah. yeah, he's doing fantastic work. 
Mm. However, I went to a, I went to a lecture with him, which, uh, recently at um, mm. um, Salisbury. Mm. I was a bit disappointed. Now, not because of not because of what he's doing. I think he's doing fantastic work. Mm. But it was, he talked about race. He, talk, he sees himself as, uh, as, as mixed race. <clears throat> I have a problem with this term. I understand mm. that mixed race or race as a concept mm. is a social concept, construct. Mm. I get that. Okay? Mm. And so we have to look at it historically. Mm. But the problem is, by buying into it, you're accepting that it exists. Mm. See, race is an illusion. Mm. Like, we have to understand this and claim it. There is just human beings. Mm. If I married a Neanderthal woman, Fully fledged the other the other says interracial. Yeah. That's a different race. That's right. <laughs> but from my understanding, if you're Homo sapien, you bleed, you go to the toilet like I do, <laughs> you cry like I do, mm -hmm. but you may express things in a different language. Mm -hmm. And you have a different pigmentation mm -hmm. based on the environment that you grew up in. Mm -hmm. So for start, the 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 if you say race. You are buying into a 19th century understanding of jawlines. You see, we, the enlightenment, the, the wonderful enlightenment that we talk about, um, that was supposed to be freedom for all men, did it include us? No. That we were cattle. Absolutely. We were not, the church treated us. They had to because you couldn't, you couldn't enslave another human being. That's against God's law. So they, they accepted the fact that actually human and Africans were three, te or, uh, three quarters three of a man, yeah. or three, three fifths or something like that, yeah. of a man, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which means that they're not completely human. <coughs> they're, they could be treated the way they would treat the environment or cattle. Mm -hmm. So they, they sanctioned, they sanctioned, I'm not going to the thing like that, I'm, I'm going on. That's one thing, racism is this. The, the other thing you, you mentioned about the, um, when I was growing up here at grammar school, my teacher said to me, oh, Ollie, you should go to a work in the factory. Mm -hmm. They had no idea that my uncles were architects mm -hmm. going and studying in Hungary. Mm -hmm. I had an aunt who went to, uh, to Moscow, to Moscow, Moscow to, to study medicine and spoke five languages mm -hmm. coming to our house. There's a discrepancy in terms of our upbringing mm -hmm. and what they thought they thought of. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> for a long time, there's this kind of, uh, now, so let's, it's really important to state race is an illusion okay. we're human mm -hmm. so the construct of racism needs to be debunked not entertained my daughter i my, i married a, an englishman my children are not interracial they are mixed heritage nothing to do with interracial mm -hmm. that's a, that's an important now um <clears throat> going back to this return being i'll be very quick because i know it's a, a difficult thing now, it's going to be interesting because most people here, in a sense, understand because it's in our culture. But I want you to, ent I'm going to entertain you in, in terms of understanding a process of um, difference. And I want to be clear that the difference doesn't mean that one is better than the other. The this is, as Peter said there about uh, contemporary African dance. As long as it's in, in, in phase with Western contemporary dance, that is contemporary. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about African, European, Chinese, Indian, contemporary. There are mixed and, 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 and ways where, where we borrow from each other, but we don't need to apologize or seek acceptance from a, from a particular way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. That's just going to stop. In my mind, it's hard, but we just gotta. We just gotta. That's just take. You've got to take the fire from underneath the pot. That's it. Okay. So, what does it mean? <clears throat> we have tempo. So, what we're spending talking about is our relationship to time and space, temporal space. Einstein talks about space time. So, it's, you know, it's temporal space. That is space and time as a fabric, not as separate things, as a fabric itself. Right. So. We have perceptions of time and space. So rhythm is the pattern that happens inside the tempo. So it's a message. Tempo 
is the speed in which a rhythm is going. So you could have an elephant ahead. The elephant would just be very slow in tempo like this. We understand that a, a hummingbird will be, have a different tempo. So you have these different tempos, but within that tempo, there is a rhythm and there's a pattern. Mm -hmm. So in, in a tempo with a beat, you have the point in which the beat occurs, the point in which the elephant stamps his foot and then opens to the next step. Mm -hmm. There's a point in which the beat occurs and the space between the beats. Mm -hmm. Now, from a Western perspective, we have a linear approach, which is, well, some of you will recognize. You, there is no, there's nothing before one. It's just prepare mm -hmm. and go. Yes. So you have one, <coughs> two. So the space between the beats is linear mm -hmm. and teleologically separate. To abstract thought now, this is abstract thought, Kemet style. Not Western style. I thought it was a bit, yeah. It's just Kemet. Yeah. So be careful, it's dangerous thinking. <laughs> so but the point at which the point at which a beat occurred, the distance between the beats. So one, two, three, four, bar. That's four is like, oh, we go to we go to another cycle. But here we've got we've got a length of time and we can see the length of duration based on the linear progress. And if you go to next, we go to the next line. Now is this is the point where I, where, I, where I offer my um for you and also for us i am not talking about either or i'm not saying very easy because when i first did this people would run to the return beat I said, oh no the linear beat is so damn it's wrong. no no linear beat is beautiful it has its thing mm -hmm. it's really important to understand we're talking about different paradigms different flowers of manifesting space and time mm -hmm. manifesting producing space and time in the way we perceive it. So linearity has this kind of thing, and with it you can have lots of different types. You can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. and then you have this kind of tempo or a, a cycle. Okay. So let's put this aside here. We'll come back to this in a minute. Return beat. For a start, we have zero. In the idea of nothing, Olodumare, you don't, you don't worship Olodumare because you don't know what it is. No one can understand that which creates all of it because it's something that's come from nothing from our perspective. It is the potential unseen. So zero, from the zero, there's a centrifugal, there's a bursting. Birth comes out, so we're already still, we're still haven't reached one yet. From the zero, we have a centrifugal, and then the return beat is when you slide back to the same point. Problem, there's no duration. If you keep doing this, well, you're going to see your, your head in the same point because we're thinking in the Western mind, yes, because we see duration like this. Oh, well, if I do this, then well, where's, where's, where's time? <clears throat> time in a Yoruba mind unfolds. So if you imagine, picture in your mind uh, a clean surface of water. And there's a dew drop coming from the water, from, from the uh, palm tree. It's been raining. It's been a thunderstorm and lots of water. And it's just at the end and it drips. Still water. And as it drips, it hits the surface, breaks the tension, and there's ripple outputs. The next one will hit the same point, but it's not the same point because the first point is rippled out. It starts there and it unripples out. So you have boop, boop, and you get waves coming out. Time and duration unfolds like a flower, not in a line. Time in a Yoruba mind grows. So you'll talk about, Peter was talking about in the, in the, in the workshop. If you're born, you're born. You become adults, you become, you know, a functional adult of society. And then as you come back down to being a child again, mm -hmm. this is when you're ripe. In the West, you're ripe when you're a teenager. Mm -hmm. 
What kind of rubbish is that? <laughs> it, when something rotten, so this is probably people gonna pick their bananas when it's green. The tree hasn't finished giving it all the things. That's right. right? You, you, you pick the banana when it's about to drop, mm. not when it's, in, when it's in its green phase. Mm. And they say, oh no, no, what happens if you put it in a thing? It'll, it'll, it'll turn. It'll turn. No, no, it still hasn't got all the juices that the, that the earth is mm. going to give. Oh man. Common sense. In the common sense. It's my mother. Oh, you use your common sense. Open your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's just you know it, so it's when you're when the person's about to die they're returning yeah. to the source mm -hmm. that's when you're right mm -hmm. is there a fallacy if you're not to be building by nine o'clock um <laughs> so time yeah um we have drinks outside um so i just want to thank everyone who's Thank our speakers. That thank you, the audience here and also um, cool. on Zoom. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. yeah. Um, and thank the, um, the think, uh, yes, I said thank the audience, but thank, I don't want to, I've got a list and I'm going to make sure that when we do the film for this, that everyone gets acknowledged because it will just take not too much time. But I do want to say thanks to Thomas. Thank you for sharing today and uh, hope that the stories you heard today and this experience will be somebody will be sharing it in 75 years from now. Mm -hmm. they, they approach the next. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.